Hello everyone, and welcome back to Worked Heat Transfer Examples. Today, we're going to do our first example looking at heat exchangers. This particular example on the course website, I'm calling example zero, and the problem is not on the handout, but I wanted to show you how to use the log mean temperature difference method. In this case, we're looking at a cooling process fluid that's cooled from 80 degrees down to 50 degrees. It has a mass flow rate of two kilograms per second, and it's set up in a shell and tube heat exchanger. We're trying to figure out if we should do counterflow or parallel flow geometries. If the cooling fluid is chilled water at 15 degrees with a mass flow rate of two and a half kilograms per second, what is the required heat transfer surface area for heat exchangers in parallel flow and in counter flow? We'll assume that the convection coefficient on the process fluid side is 3,500 watts per meter squared Kelvin and 4,500 4, on the chilled water side. If we were sketching the problem, it would look something like this, at least when we're doing parallel flow. We would know the temperature at the inlet of the hot side, the mass flow rate, and the specific heat on the hot side. We know the temperature exit on the hot side. We know the temperature inlet on the cold side, as well as the mass flow rate. But we don't know the temperature outlet on the cold side. We're told the heat transfer coefficients on the hot side and on the cold side. And the problem asks us to find the heat transfer area required to get these results in a parallel flow heat exchanger and in a counter flow heat exchanger. Assumptions we'll make for this problem include that the problem is at steady state, that the fluid and material properties are constant, that there are no losses to the surroundings, that there's no axial conduction along the tube, and that the tube has a thin wall with no fouling, so we can neglect the resistance of the wall of the tube. When I do heat exchanger problems, I like to look at this two by two matrix. Here, I'm looking at the objective. For heat exchangers, usually we're trying to figure out the size or the heat that's being transferred. And I look at the method, the log mean temperature difference, which I can use with counterflow and parallel flow heat exchangers, and the effectiveness NTU method, which I use with more complex heat exchanger geometries. In this case, because we're trying to find the area, we're interested in sizing the heat exchanger. And because I have a counterflow and a parallel flow heat exchanger, I can use the log mean temperature difference method. Using this method is usually faster, so I'll use it when I can. Here you can see what quadrant of my two by two matrix I'm in. The first thing that I do is finding the heat. So I know for heat exchangers, if I'm neglecting lo heat losses to the surrounding, that all the heat that comes out of the hot side of my heat exchanger must go into the cold side of my heat exchanger. So here I know that M dot times CP delta T is equal for the hot side and the cold side. Now in heat transfer, we'll often talk about capital C sub H on the hot side and capital C sub C on the cold side. Here, capital C is the fluid heat capacity rate, which is equal to M dot CP. The next thing that I'll do after finding the heat is to size the problem. So here, it depends if I have a heat exchanger in parallel flow or in counter flow. So in parallel flow, I use this log mean temperature difference, where the heat transfer is equal to the effective heat transfer coefficient times the area times the log mean temperature difference. Now, it doesn't matter if my flow is in parallel or in counter flow. My log mean temperature difference, shown here, is delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by the natural log of delta T1 divided by delta T2. 
Now the difference, if I'm in parallel flow or in counter flow, is how I define delta T1 and delta T2. So delta T1 always includes the hot inlet. And then the other temperature it includes is the temperature that touches the hot inlet. So in this case, for parallel flow, delta T1 is T hot in minus T cold in. Delta T2 always includes the hot outlet, and in this case is delta T equals T hot out minus T cold out. If I was doing a counterflow problem, the first few lines look the same, but I define delta T1 and delta T2 differently. Here, delta T1 again includes the hot temperature inlet, but now the hot temperature inlet touches the cold outlet. So this is T hot in minus T cold out, and delta T2 is equal to T hot out minus T cold in. And that's the difference between parallel and counter flow heat exchangers when using the log mean temperature difference method. So the first thing we need to do is find heat. We know that the heat transfer is equal to m dot cp times delta t on either side of the heat exchanger. In this case, I know all the information on the hot side at the inlet and the outlet. So I'll start there. I can see that I have values for everything in my equation on the hot side. I plug that into my equation and I find that the heat transferred between the hot side and the cold side is 210,000 watts or 210 kilowatts. The next thing that I want to do is find the cold outlet temperature. Here I can use the fact that if everything is insulated and there's no heat loss to the surroundings, then all the heat that leaves the hot side of my heat exchanger goes into the cold side of my heat exchanger. So I take M dot times CP times delta T and make it equal on both sides. Note that my temperature differences are flipped for the hot side and the cold side, where one is inlet minus outlet and the other is outlet minus inlet. I do this so I get a positive value on both sides. But if you'd prefer, you can take the absolute value of these on both sides. The only thing that I don't know here is the cold outlet temperature. So I can rearrange my equation to isolate T cold out. I know T cold in, I know Q, I know M dot cold, but I don't know CP on the cold side. So I guess I didn't know everything I thought I did. I can find the specific heat of water on the cold side by looking it up in the table. In this case, table A.6. I'll assume that my average temperature on the cold side is about 300 degrees Kelvin. I don't know T cold out yet, so I really can't find this analytically. If I'm way off, I can always iterate through. So here, if I look up 300 degrees, I look up CPF, right? Because we're talking about the fluid here. And I find that CP is 4,179 joules per kilogram Kelvin. I put that back into my equation. I do some work on my calculator and I find that the outlet temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. Now I can start sizing in the parallel flow heat exchanger. I know delta T1, 65 degrees Celsius. I know delta T2, which is 15 degrees Celsius. With that information, I can find the log mean temperature difference for my parallel flow heat exchanger, 34.1 degrees Celsius. Here, I'm looking to find the area. I know Q, because I found it in the last part of the problem. I know the log mean temperature difference, but I don't know the effective heat transfer coefficient. To find the effective heat transfer coefficient, I invoke the assumption that the tube separating the hot flow and the cold flow is thin, and that there's no fouling on this tube. When I talk about fouling, the longer we run the heat exchanger, the more stuff will build up on the wall and that will add resistance to our heat transfer over time. 
if we invoke this thin wall assumption, we can say that the effective heat transfer coefficient is given by this equation. I know these values, and I find that the effective heat transfer coefficient is 1,968.75 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So now I can put that information into my equation and find the area for my parallel flow heat exchanger. In this case, the area for parallel flow heat exchanger is 3.13 meters squared. Now I can run through the same process in my counterflow heat exchanger. In this case, I'm going to follow the same process, but delta 1 or delta T1 and delta T2 are slightly different. Remember, delta T1 is always the hot side inlet minus whatever temperature it touches. In this case, it's 45 degrees Celsius. Delta T2 is 35 degrees Celsius. And my log mean temperature difference is 39.8 degrees Celsius. I have the same equation for the counterflow heat exchanger area. Note also that the effective heat transfer coefficient doesn't change because it didn't depend on delta T1 and delta T2. Here I can put some numbers in my calculator and I find that the area for the parallel flow heat exchanger is just under 2.7 meters squared. What that means is just by changing the plumbing going from parallel flow to counter flow, I've reduced the area that I need or the size of my heat exchanger by 14%. This is a fairly straightforward change to make in many cases and shows that counter flow heat exchangers are more efficient than parallel flow heat exchangers. Evelyn wants you to know that she really, really, really loves Baby Shark. Thank you for joining us for Work Heat Transfer Examples, and I'll see you again next time.